Hello to anyone watching here, as well as live with us in Zoom. Um, we're really lucky to have uh, Sally Mardelu from the Australian National University here today. Um, she focuses on uh, use of neural nets and an analysis of neural nets for language documentation and low resource uh, language tools, and is going to talk to us about her ongoing work today. So turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I know we're all bombarded with a lot of stuff going on live, so it's nice to have you with us today. I'm going to talk to you guys about um, basically a small section of my research on whether transformers actually um, transform transformer models actually do phonology like a linguist. Um, I just threw up the picture of a Rorschach test because essentially we're trying to see what kind of pattern or what um, categories or generalizations the transformer models make. Um, so just to give you a brief overview, we'll be talking a bit about um, sequence to sequence models. Um, then I'm going to be talking about our language design because our experiments are basically um, working off of a constructed language. I'll go in a bit, go into a bit about how we actually generated the link, the um, data. Um, and then I'll be talking about the experiments we run. So to start with, we look at um, whether it's actually worth using neural nets to model phonological phenomena. Um, and then we go into when they do, when we do use them to model the phenomena, whether they actually generalize to linguistic categories. Um, and then we go in further to look at whether it learns something like word internal structures to so something like syllables. Um, and lastly, we're gonna be talking a bit about rule ordering. Um, which keeps a lot of phonologists up at night. So, um, and then just some concluding remarks and references. So um, I'm sure a lot of you guys already know, neural networks has taken the linguistics um, or computational linguistics scene by storm. So in a sense, we're basically mapping one, um, one vector to another. It's a non-linear transformation of the input. Um, there's a lot of examples of very, very good results, which is why it's such a big thing. Um, and of course, the main drawback that we have is that we need to tailor things, um, the, wrangle the data in the right format to be able to actually um, utilize these tools. Um, so more specifically, um, with encoded decoders, we basically have some kind of input. We generate an abstract representation, and then we use that abstract representation um, to decode into something else. So this is commonly used in machine translation. Um, this kind of um, model, these kind of models, uh, there's a lot of resources for. So we have the BioSTM um, and the transformer. Today, I'm going to be talking about the transformer. Um, so like I said, we see this in a lot of different places. So we see it in machine translation. We can use this in the context of speech recognition as well. Same idea, you have an input um, and then you basically generate an abstract representation. Um, and then from the abstract representation, you decode into the desired output. So I just threw up some examples of where this is actually used. Um, similarly, we have a similar idea going on in syntactic parsing as translation. So you have this idea of delinearizing trees um, in the abstract representation to then basically give you syntactic information as the output. Um, and then we have thing, similar idea again in word inflection as translation. So you might have an input um, that's basically in a different language with some morphological tags as the input fed into the encoder, sorry, um, generate an abstract representation. And then from there, we can actually get the inflected form of the um, input. So this task is obviously um, done very well. So the main um, research in this vein is basically the Sigmorphon shear tasks. Um, in particular, I've just threw up the Sigmorphon 2020 shear task. Um, basically, the, we, um, the data format is you have a lemma with a tag and an inflected form. So you can see the example here, dog. It's a noun with plural, so you get dogs. Um, so in the shared task, well, now last year, um, you had basically 15 language families, total of 90 languages. Um, and out of the 22 systems that were submitted, um, 19 were neural. So we know that um, basically 
the neural networks are working really well in this area. The four top performing um, teams that achieved over 90% were neural networks. So obviously very relevant. Um, so we've basically, um, I should jump ahead of myself. So the research questions that I'm trying to address today are basically as follows. So the first thing we want to look at are whether some phenomena are harder to actually model than others. So intrinsically, um, you might think that metathesis would be harder to model than apocope. Um, and we look at basically 29 different phenomena and see how we actually go about modeling them. Um, the second question we look at is categorization. So whether neural networks actually can get categorized um, to a linguistic category. So um, the linguistic categories we're looking at today are basically vowels and consonants or more specifically stops. Um, and we're looking at uh, yeah, whether the actual neural network can recognize that as a specific category. The third question we're looking at today is basically whether um, we can learn or neural networks, whether they can learn uh, word structures, and in this case, we're looking at the syllable. Um, and the final question we're going to be addressing is rule interaction. So whether neural networks actually learn particular rule orderings from interaction cases. And specifically, we look at things like finished phrasing and a simplified version of Canadian raising. Um, so I'll talk a bit about our language design, because I mentioned that we're, but the data we use is basically a constructed language. The prime motivation for that is we wanted to be able to actually control the statistics of the things we've generated. If we actually use real data from a language, just be a bit more tricky and time consuming to actually make sure that we have the properties that we're, uh, the, with the properties and the phenomena um, that we're actually trying to model. So, um, with that in mind, we tried our best to actually make the language as representative as possible. So basically, we went with typo the the uh, with the typologically most common features. So we went with five vowel system that's listed on the screen, um, and a nineteen consonant system again on the screen. Um, and we went with um, basic syllable structures, so you can um, see the onset nucleus encoder that's available. Um, and as just another consideration to make it as realistic as possible, we basically made sure that the consonant clusters didn't get weird by using a sonority metric, um, just because we wanted to make it as realistic as possible. Um, so the typological information we got uh, from some of, the some of the sources that are listed at the bottom of the screen. So in terms of how we actually generated the data, um, we basically first started um, with step one here. So it's a lot of, um, generating the actual lexicon. So um, firstly, we start with generating the acceptable syllable structure, um, given the uh, onset nucleus encoder that are available. Um, and then we create sample word lengths. Um, again, to make it as realistic as possible, we, in, we ensured that the word length distribution is actually Gaussian um, and that the average word length is about eight characters long, um, which seems to hold um, across quite a lot of languages. Um, the second stage of our data generation is basically generating the input-output pairs. Um, and we did this using FOMA, which is basically a way to compile finite state um, transducers in this case. Um, so we generate rules for phonological processes. You can see here on the screen again, an example of apheresis. Um, and we're generating data that basically has the lemma, the tag, um, and an output. And then the last stage is basically cleaning the data up for FairSeq. So um, we also sample the input output pairs according to our experiment design and just make sure that it's in the required format. Um, so here's a bit of a uh, screenshot on what our actual data looks like. Um, so we follow the 70 20 10 split, that's typical. Um, and we also include training um, data that. It, in our training data, we also include a copy tag. And that's just because um, previous research has actually shown that um, transformer models perform poorly at generalizing when asked to inflect previously, uncom like previously unseen things. So we just want to make sure that that's not an effect that we're seeing through because um, that's not what we're interested in. So um, our first experiment is basically whether um, the neural network models can model phonological processes. So here's this massive screen that's a little 
overwhelming and I tried to make it a bit fun with different colours. Um, but these are the different phonological phenomena that we considered. So it goes all the way from syncope to haplology, metathesis, um, and everything in between. Um, I'm not going to go into each and every one of these because it'll take forever and it'd be more of a phonology talk, but um, you can ask me at the end if you have any questions or um, the ones that we're going to be zoning in on, um, I'll be giving a bit of examples for. So, um, so this was just basically a um, baseline that we wanted to establish, um, basically to establish that um, it is worth actually using neural nets um, for phonological processes. Um, so here are our results in this bar chart. You can see that for the most part, it's basically getting over 90%, um, or over 95% for basically all of them. Um, we tried to keep the sample sizes comparable because we know that that influences um, results and accuracies. And yeah, we can see that they're just doing a great job at capturing the processes. And it doesn't seem to make a difference whether you go from something as simple as apocope to something that's um, you know, a linguist would consider more complex like metathesis. So um, perhaps the, I, I think the more interesting thing coming from that baseline is whether neural networks can generalize over linguistic categories. So we've split this experiment into two parts. Um, basically, we the first part is um, whether they can recognize certain characters as vowels. Um, so I'm calling these vowel experiments. And the way we've set these experiments up are basically um, with having a priming case and a withheld case. So but what I mean by that is basically in the priming case, in first instance, the apheresis, we have all instances of apheresis, so all vowels, you know, the five vowels that we have in our set, um, in the training set. And for the withheld case, which is apocope, um, we have all vowels except the U. So, um, you basically have two phenomena to train in this model. Um, and so we follow that um, similar setup for the rest of the experiments as well. So for the vowel experiments, we have the apocope apheresis pair. Um, we also have the vowel shortening and lengthening pair. Um, and in the consonant slash stops experiment, um, we have basically the gemination, degemination pair and the and devoicing into vocalic voicing. So um, you can see on the screen for the vowel experiments, the two withheld cases um, in the training data is the U case. Um, and for the consonants, uh, basically um, for gemination, degemination, we've withheld the P. So in the gemination case, you don't see P going to double P. Um, and in the devoicing and intervocalic voicing, again, we hold the P, um, so you don't get the case of intervocalic, you don't see the cases of intervocalic voicing um, P going to B. So um, to start with, we look at the experiment results for the apheresis apocope experiment. Um, again, you can see that's actually doing quite well. So the model can extend the apocope rule to the unseen value. So um, you can see, we can basically conclude that um, it is actually generalizing U as a vowel, even though it hasn't seen um, the case of U for apocope before. Um, there are eight errors um, where it isn't deleted, and the errors basically look like um, those on the left hand, bottom left of the screen. So basically ignores the U um, and doesn't do anything with it. Uh, but I think this is very encouraging results. So we can see that you can actually extend to you. Um, we see a similar kind of thing with the shortening and lengthening. I haven't even bothered to put up the errors because there, there were only two errors and they're not from the target category. So that's just um, basically nonce errors. Um, so again, we see an overwhelming um, evidence, sense of evidence for um, being able to extend the pattern to the unseen value. Um, so for the gemination, degemination experiment, again, we can see a good case of actually extending um, P as a consonant. Um, and you would expect, like I, I should note here, so given that the um, set of vowels was only five, um, to be able to extend P to 19, you would expect more instances of that kind of training because it's a larger category. Um, but um, again, we see an overwhelming sense of um, being able to extend. So um, when we do get errors, we basically get errors where um, in most, most of these cases where it's just ignoring 
pee and doesn't know what to do with it, where it should be like um, germinating, but it's just not. Um, so the devoiting into the Kellogg experiment is actually quite interesting. Um, it's the one case where we actually don't really see a super convincing um, sense of generalization. Um, so we get about 77, 78% accuracy. Um, and that just um, raises the question as to why. So um, to further kind of expand some of the statistics. So to look at the actual distribution of the priming case, we basically have um, 254 instances of the devoicing tag in the training set um, where the rule is triggered. So we do actually, I should have noted, um, through the actual setup of this experiment, we did actually try to make sure that we had a balanced um, set of training data. So you do have um, tags, like the tag of the phenomena where it is triggered and where it isn't, um, just so we're not actually overfitting things. Uh, so in the cases, in this case, um, we had 254 instances of the devoicing tag where the rule is actually triggered. And of those um, 83 cases were um, B going to P. So this would be the relevant um, bit where the model could potentially infer something for the intervocalic P to B instance. Um, so we decided to, Kind of run a few more experiments on this just to see what was happening. Um, so we basically kind of tweaked the experiment a bit. Um, the first set is basically the word initial voicing. So instead of um, devoicing at the end of the word, which is what we had initially paired with the intervocalic voicing, we did word initial voicing. So now we have the same operation. In other words, P going to be um, and they're in different environments rather than um, word final. The reason for that was pretty much trying to kind of still um, tie into some linguistic basis because um, you don't often get um, voicing at the word final uh, location. <clears throat> so you can see, even though it's doing the same operation in different environments, um, we actually get a worse result. Um, so uh, looking again at the distribution, we basically had 551 instances of where the um, intervocalic uh, sorry, where the rule was actually triggered um, and, only, um, and 141 cases of where P was going to be. Um, so that was surprising um, because we assumed that the same, if you had the same operation um, that was basically in the training set for the priming, then it should easily be able to extend for the withheld case, but clearly that was not the case. Um, and then we actually tested for word initial devoicing um, just to um, keep things consistent in terms of the training set. Um, so the reason we didn't do voice uh, word final devoicing in this case was just because we wanted to keep all of the um, test size and training size consistent. Um, and so basically um, this experiment is you have different operations. So B going to P um, for the word initial devoicing and P to B in the intervocalic voicing. Um, and we had similar um, distribution for the priming case, so 557 instances where the word is triggered and 152 cases of where P goes to B. Um, and we can see that it's actually a significant difference in the accuracy, um, which is somewhat surprising um, because it is an opposite operation. So um, this is still kind of a burning question that keeps me up at night. Um, if anyone has any suggestions um, at the end or now, you're welcome to say anything or contribute a question. Um, but yeah, this is something I'm still thinking about why that actually might be the case. So um, to move on to the next question that we had, which was basically whether we can actually recognize or generalize over word internal structures. Um, so in this case, we're looking at syllables. Now, um, even in linguistics, looking at things like syllables or um, word internal structures is actually quite tricky. So um, it is actually quite hard to try to set up an experiment that says what you think it's saying. Um, so we decided to actually focus on the uh, phonological phenomena of haplology, um, because basically you kind of do have to recognize a CV um, cluster. So um, basically, haplology is where you delete the entire um, syllable, um, second syllable, 
um, that is identical to the first. So in the haplology case, it'd be haplogy. Um, so in addition to the process of haplology in experiment setup, we include um, two other processes. We include um, word final vowel deletion and word final consonant deletion. And the idea for this is again, to kind of use it as a priming experiment to induct the um, model into recognizing vowels and consonants. Um, because the idea is um, the CV then could potentially be able to cut, fall out from that. So in our training data, um, we include sufficient amounts of CV1 and CV2 clusters. That's just because we want to make sure that it's not just um, getting CV, CV mixed up. Um, we also remove um, certain CV, CV structures. Um, and, and this was just arbitrary. So it's essentially one vowel per consonant. Um, just to have an unseen um, category. Um, we also hold out the double haplology example. So this is where haplology would occur more than once in the word. Um, so our experiments show, uh, so to test this, I should say, CV, CV boundary, again, we look at the unseen CVCV CV structures, um, and you can see that it actually does quite well um, in generalizing for that. So it gets about 94% accuracy. Um, and in words where haplology occurs more than once um, is basically where we're getting a lot of the errors. Um, and that kind of, um, the errors that are generated are basically where you have haplology being correctly applied in the first instance of um, the haplology, um, but not in the second. So it only gets one out of the 91 um, cases that we have. Um, and just to make sure that um, we aren't just learning to delete repeating sequences and that we are really genuinely actually recognizing CV um, structures, we also have a test case on the same for the same model um, of VCVC structures. Um, and you can see that there are cases where it's a little overzealous, um, but it is getting about 78% accuracy. So um, they'll leave a little bit of room for improvement. So um, just to give a breakdown, you can see that the most, um, the largest source of error is basically double haplology cases, as I mentioned. Um, and in the cases of the unseen CVCV structures, again, it just doesn't know what to do. So it basically guesses what the input is. Um, and in general cases um, of haplology errors, we just have it being a little overzealous. Um, so basically it's not, it's, it's a failed instance of um, CV recognition. Um, for the final um, experiments, we basically looked at rule ordering. So um, basically we have um, two types of rule ordering in like that we're considering here. So the feeding, bleeding and the counterfeeding, counterbleeding. So to look at these, we've um, basically looked at two experiments. Um, so we look at finished raising and simplified Canadian raising. So for finished raising, um, we basically have these rules. So we have a word final E going to an I um, and then a T going to an S before an I. Um, we remove for our, our training set, we remove all interacting cases. So basically um, words that end in TI. We also remove these from the copy cases um, because uh, we don't want to actually have any sort of influence through the um, process. Um, so to look at the sample ordering, um, essentially what we would expect if it's one, two ordering would be CC if the input was TTER. So you can see the step-by-step -step process of how you would get there. If it was two, one ordering, we would expect it to be CT. Um, so our results basically show that we're not really seeing any interaction. Um, so we're seeing the 2-1 ordering. Uh, so basically, um, you can see what the errors that are produced, which is, of course, this, we're calling it errors because we're assuming a 1-2 um, flow, ordering, I should say, um, but we actually get 2-1. So um, it does actually, given the low sort of training set size, um, it still gets 100% for both the raising and the palatalization. Um, but yeah, we don't see any interaction. Um, so then we actually decided, because that was, we were expecting something different, we decided to extend um, our line of questioning to Canadian raising. So 
Canadian raising, our simplified version is basically TD going to G before any vowel and A going to E before P, T or K. Again, we removed interacting cases. So we had A, T before any vowel um, and removed A before T, P, T, K and um, D, T, D before V from all the copy cases. So in a similar way, um, we've listed the sample ordering. So if it was one, two ordering and your input was Tata, we would assume that the output would be Gaga. If it was two, one ordering and the input was Tata, we would go from Tata, Tete to Gege. So results here um, show a clear evidence that the model predicts basically a two, one ordering. Um, and that's, um, yeah, so you can see that there's only four, only four of the seven areas predict um, a aga instead of iga. Um, in other words, the one two ordering, um, and there are the other two. The uh, sorry, the other two more errors are basically um, from how the model deals with repeat characters, which are kind of a known phenomena in neural network land. So um, some of the areas, the four areas actually that you can see are listed here. So we do actually see different ordering preferred um, in this case, which is kind of puzzling because um, we wanted to understand why one ordering would be preferred over the other or what actually tips um, that kind of training. Um, training, I should say, what kind of tips it to actually model it in that way. Um, and that's still something that we're working on because um, this is still work in progress. Um, but just to give a quick run through of some of the things that we did address as a conclusion. So the first question we asked was modeling different um, phonological phenomena. And we do show that sequence to sequence models can successfully capture 29 different phonological phenomena with ranging degrees of complexity and um, just different kind of processes. Um, uh, the second question we looked at was linguistic categorization, um, whether the generalization was actually linguistically comparable. And for the most part, we did actually see that the neural networks could actually recognize vowels and consonants as a category, um, as shown by our apocope aphoresis example, uh, experiment and our lengthening shortening experiment, as well as um, the gemination degemination pair for the consonant category. Uh, the devoicing intervocalic experiment raises further questions. Um, I don't think it's a very clear example of um, basically the model successfully generalizing to those categories. Um, and it, it actually does actually, uh, sorry, it does raise further questions on whether opposite, why the opposite operation helps the model rather than the same operation. Um, and one further question might be um, whether, or rather how, uh, sensitive to the location or the conditioning of the rule the model is um, to be able to transfer some bits um, from the other, from one process to the other. The third question that we looked at was basically word internal structures. So um, we do show that it, the model actually does quite well at capturing haplology. Um, it can actually extend to unseen CVCV CV structures. So it shows some level of awareness for CV structures. Um, it is also unfortunately a little overzealous with deletion. So we did see that in the VCVC VC structure. Um, and it does deal poorly when the rule is required to be applied twice. Um, so the, this also opens up the next question on how else we could actually interrogate for word internal um, structure understanding. As I mentioned, this is actually kind of difficult from a linguistic point of view as well. So if anyone has any suggestions or idea, we're, well, I'm happy to hear it and discuss further. Um, and the last thing that we looked at was basically rule interaction. So in one instance, we saw no rule interaction um, in the Finnish case. And then in, in the Canadian case, we did actually see rule interaction. Um, so I guess the question that we're trying to address next is um, why interaction is learnt in one case but not the other and what factor actually influences this. So just throw up my references. Um, just want to thank everyone for listening um, and I hope you got something out of it.